All right, uh, so let's get started today. Um, I have a couple things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about form studies. I haven't done that. And I'm going to look at some more dragon challenges, talk about some lighting. This time I actually want to paint over some of them. Um, I have this piece, this piece, and this piece. All right, so for form studies, um, one of the problems you have, this is also not fully uh, grayscale. Uh, one of the problems that you have is <clears throat> that you are, take a look, see this? How dark is that? Well, the shadow area is also pretty dark. So you have shadows pooling up here and here, telling me that the light source is coming from this direction. But what are we seeing here? Look at the radial values. They climb this way. Shorter here, longer here, meaning that the light source is top down. So something's happening here, something's wrong. So you have two different light sources on the same object. This is what happens in your paintings, boys and girls. This is, the, this is an example of what you guys do to your poor paintings. Why does it keep going to 60? Um, so when you guys have these kinds of issues, <clears throat> what happens is we, sorry, one second. We don't, we don't clear them out when like next time we get into a painting. So on a, a body or on a face, we end up creating light source situations that come out of two light sources on an object, casting shadows in the wrong directions, doing just a big mess, just turns into a big mess. Um, here, let me get a better uh, lasso so I can just save the lasso in another, another layer. Select inverse. All right. So, what I want fixed is what I'm going to do is I'm going to preserve the top down light source. And your form studies are supposed to be studying top down anyway. So, that means that this entire upper area would have been exposed to light. Let me just deselect all of this so I only have one area. That means that all of this is looking up at the light. It's part of what is being exposed to the light. And this is how we get to 3D. So you guys are probably wondering, what's the point of form studies? Points of form studies is that you learn how to paint a shape in 3D. You learn how to paint a face in 3D. Write that back to me. If you can paint a face three-dimensionally, you can paint a face, I mean a shape three-dimensionally, you can paint a face three-dimensionally, sorry, I'm just all over the place, too many classes today. Um, so that's the point. And what we want to do is maximize our 3D skills on shapes. It transfers. Some of you think it doesn't transfer, some of you think it transfers, but really weird looking uh, faces happen, especially when you follow too closely with those how to draw a face, they end up drawing a really robotic looking face, not with shapes. Shapes help you memorize what to do with your brush, help you develop what exactly is supposed to be done with your brush in this kind of contour. Those are my nuggets, by the way. <laughs> Did you guys hear that bell? <laughs> those are my nuggets. Um, as you know, I love, I love chicken nuggets. Um, so. What we see here is a buildup of values like a pile, radial values building up to point towards the direction of the light source. And then we have shadows pooling in the opposite direction. That's the magic of painting something to make it look three-dimensional. We use a shape as you know, practice grounds to learn how to climb values to the light source and climb values away from the light source. 3D shape equals 3D face. So the tops of anything, um, the top of the head. Usually the top of the head isn't as bright as the forehead and the nose and whatnot. So this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing this projected on the face. So project this 3D shape, project the form study on the human face. Also write that back to me. And that means that we are learning how to paint the face and then remembering it next time we learn how to paint shape, sorry, and remembering next time we look at a shape. And, God damn it, <laughs> learning how to paint a shape and remembering it the next time we look at a face and then we um, align it. So this forehead right here, this would be the forehead, uh, somewhere down here would be the chin, all in this top-down light source to help us perfect, um, you know, just the presentation, perfect one specific light source situation above all else. So, now that we took care of that, we've pulled all the values the way they're supposed to be in opposite directions or growing directions toward the light source. Now we have to talk about degrees of elevation. So when we look at this 
bulge right here. Is it really, should, should these really be as bright as this bulge? No, because these pieces right here are further away from the light source and not as exposed to the light source. So these get dimmer. This one gets hottest. I'm actually going to dim this one too and bring in a new, a new shine. This one is much further away from the light source and definitely not as exposed as this. So this one should be dimmed all the way. Not all the way, like all the way for it to stay a light, so uh, uh, a light, like a highlighted area. And then I'm moving all these shadows away. Just like that. And now I will build up the highest point, but only in one area, the area that is most exposed. Forehead, nose, whatever you end up projecting this onto for the face, and we have this three-dimensional shape. So we end up comparing what it looked like before Light source is coming from the bottom, but the the shadows are pointing from a light source coming from the bottom, but the highlights are pointing to a light source coming from the top. It didn't look 3D. It looked muddy. Um, it didn't look 3D. It looked muddy, yeah. And um, and it, uh, it had a little, it was a little bit patchy because of the excess highlight you had. If you had shines where there wouldn't be shines, and it looked a little bit overpainted or or, or um, it looked uh, too shiny, too cheap, like overusing photo. Um, we're using dodge tool. Sorry, I'm all over the place. I'm so sorry. Um, so now what we did is we balanced that all out. We pointed it back to the light source. We can we can shine areas. We can build areas just a little bit, but as long as they don't contest this really really important highlighter area right there. Same thing with your circles. You seem to be having shadows. Of course, this is much better because the more you complicate the sphere, the more mistakes you're going to make. Uh, so try to perfect your sphere sphere before you move into more complicated organic shapes. These are wonderful blobs. Now you know a mistake that you have. You're susceptible to bringing in two, one primary light source and then another, another ghost light source that casts shadows in the opposite direction. So now you know that you do that and you can work against it. Uh, but at least here you don't have the same kind of shadow at the top. Before you had a core shadow where there wouldn't be a core shadow at all. This is a break in, you know, the space-time continuum. This is impossible. We will never have a shadow cast on a highlight area that is exposed to the light source without an object casting that shadow. Shadows don't just get cast out of nowhere. Uh, that would be weird, you know, like a rip in the world and a shadow from another dimension pops in and we get it. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so there's that. There's also the issue of the light source, uh, the light environment. The light source um, is, needs a more strong light environment. And that means that what am I saying? It's not a strong light source. It's not a strong, stronger light environment. It's just a more strong light source. So let me see if I can make sense of my life right now. So I'm just raising the brightness just a little bit to make sense of all of these shadows that have happened and all of these lights that have happened. Um, so these, these, these light areas mean that the light source is strong, bouncing on the walls as well. Always paint the walls. Don't forget about the wall. What are the three main components, the three t points of the triangle of a light environment? Can anyone um, describe them? <laughs> Can anyone list them for me? Also, please write these notes down for yourself. The more of a physical copy you have of your notes, the easier it will be for you to remember uh, these fundamentals later on. Now that we've boosted the light source, what happens is we have to think about or boosted the background value, we have to start thinking about the bounce light. And the bounce light diffuses shadows, so it sits somewhere around here. And it makes stuff even more three-dimensional. And again, the more 3D this shape looks, the more 3D your face will look. Right, so look at that beautiful bounce light we have there now. Isn't that nice? And that will come back. That will come back the next time you paint a face. It'll really make everything look realistic as if there is a room and in the room there are lights bouncing all around and uh, diffusing each other and all that. There can also be only one area that's getting more bounce light than the other so we could be having something as strong as this if it's a separate light source bouncing around diffusing shadows all the way around here. Anything that looks down at the light source if there was a second one nearby if there was a mirror or a white table so the more you can paint a three-dimensional shape in, an, in, an, in a format study environment, the better your faces will look. It's automatic. There's no conscious or there's no, there's no manual way for you to improve them both. 
by doing one, it, it's automatic, the other will improve. This meaning that you don't have, you can just sit back and relax, do the form studies, get some critiques, correct, do some form studies, get some critiques, correct, follow your visual instinct till it looks right to you, and I promise you, the same thing will start happening in your, in your faces. But a lot of students skip form studies, and they go straight into faces, and they paint a face, make mistakes, refuse critique, or get critique and then and then and then demonize the, criti the, the the critic and then they move on to their next portrait and then they demonize the critic that comes after them and tries to fix what the mistakes they made and then they slow down their improvement so much it turns into a trickle but when you do form studies like this you're boosting your improvement drastically over many things not just the face but the next time you try to paint an arm you'll be able to to do it much better because you're taking on both Organic and geometric form studies, you'll be able to take on the skeleton and its effects on an arm if you're doing a figure drawing and, uh, and etc. So next up we have these pieces here, which are a little bit um, too dark. So the light environment would come back and bounce on all of these shapes. They wouldn't be able to get this dark. The value behind these shapes right here is telling me that you know, the shapes that you, the, the value for the midtone and the highlight is telling me that the shape isn't really that dark. So if it's not that dark, if it's like a light white or a light, I mean like a dark white or a light gray value for the shape, then it would never be able to hit black if it's in a light environment that doesn't allow really, really strong shadows creeping. So the light environment is too bright to have all of these dark spots happen out of nowhere. It's like someone got paint and only painted one side. <clears throat> All right, uh, direction, strength, bounce light, light source, light environment, and background. Oh my. Uh, that's, that's what you guys think a light environment is? Direction, strength, and bounce light? No. Light source, core shadow environment? No. Key light, fill light, backlight? No. Those are not the three corners of a light environment. What happens is we have a light source, we have an object, and we have a background. Those are the three components of a light environment. It's an environment of light bouncing off each, three, each, each of the three objects. So what we have is object number one, which is the bounce light, which is the source light, sorry. It's bouncing light. Object number two, which is the actual physical object, it's bouncing light. And the background behind and you know combining these two the space basically it could be it you know open air space or a room also bouncing light these are the three components of a light environment if you guys didn't know if after all my lecturing and you guys couldn't say these um up at the back of your hand i'm, I'm very disappointed the thing is a lot of you are new so <laughs> i can't be too rough on you guys but there are regulars here who should have been able to answer that question uh, Hamish should have been able to answer that question. Mariana should have been able to answer that question. Um, Patrick Pinkley Pinkleshin, Pink Pinkushin. <laughs> I mean Prickly Pinkushin. Um, he shouldn't. It's okay. You didn't know. Um, maybe Nika should have been able to answer the question. Uh, Ezem definitely. James Joseph, you should have been able to answer that. So, you know, this is why all of you need to start doing form studies. You don't have to, oh, it was your second answer, okay. Um, you don't have to post every single one of these posts, uh, every single one of these form studies to the community. Um, you know, you can just do them offhand, watching TV, watching whatever, you can just do the form study. You just have to keep your mind uh, fluent in the language of forms and form studies because that's when you strip off the you know the, the portrait you strip off the costume design the characterization and the net and the narrative you are left with nothing but form write that back to me if you can if you strip off the characterization and the narrative and the costume and the portraits and the whatever and the gestures you strip off all of the illustration accessories you strip off the divas of the, of the illustration you strip off the, the, the subject, you are left with nothing but light on form. You are left with nothing but form. We could sculpt this and add color and, and, and you know, just keep adding more and more and making the blob more and more detailed and turn it into an illustration, or we can just strip it down to its bare components, perfect our understanding of those, solidify our foundation of form knowledge, and then go right back up and re-add all those polys and get a fully rendered image that is really sound form-wise. 
<clears throat> it's okay, Mariana. I'm just I'm just picking on you guys. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> Look, look, YouTubers, look what she's... Shame with the bell. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, John, Lan, John Lu says, just wanted to say thanks. Stumbled on your videos. You're very, very welcome. You binge-watched binge watch them all? Wow. Remove details from an object and you are left with form. Strip off all that junk and all you got is form. Um, I thought you were going to say all you got is funk. Um, if you're strip, if you strip everything, you're left with nothing but form. Um, so if you perfect all of that, uh, you'll, you'll be able to, you know, do a lot. Nothing will be able to sneak up on you. Um, there is no form in the world that you won't be able to break down into its core components and figure it out and render it properly. <clears throat> all right. So thinking about all of that, let's go back to some of these paintings. Um, so what you have here is a light source. So you showed me this earlier in the Discord group and. I, uh, I let you know that this was actually the source of all the light in the painting. So we need something like this. So I'm using a uh, dodge tool on midtones. I don't want to use a uh, dodge tool on uh, uh, highlights because what will happen is it will make it too saturated. I want this to be a bare daylight color. So I'm removing all color from this light source in a second. So I'm just going to make this a little sharper at the top. You see that? Light sources tend to be a little sharper where they start. So that's a fundamental. So you write that down. Light sources are sharper at the, at the uh, what do you call it? The start of the projection, the, the base, the, you can call it the tail and then you can call it the head. I don't know. When they first emanate the first part of the ray, the first half of the ray, um, it, it's always the sharpest and then the ray gets to be a little bit more fuzzy. That's just because the rays are spreading apart instead of being beside each other, creating that sharpness. Also, Izum, I'm going to darken this top half over here. I'm darkening it for a very good reason. And that's because this is the frame of the painting. I can't allow light to travel that high up. I'm also going to create the shape of the cast shadow or the shape of the spotlight right here on the surface. of the rock just like that just spreading all over the rock and then the shadows that come out of that just like so and then the man the the man's uh he seems like a humanoid he doesn't seem like a man um the silhouette could be a little bit more anatomically sound it could be just a weird little robot if you wanted to just add some bolts and some weird little lines and you have like let me do it right now and that way you can actually like get a like a character out of this. So maybe um, let me just do this because right now what I'm adding is detail points, rendering points. Rendering points is when you have more intrigue in the painting. You have something like a that's a shrinking of a brush happening somewhere, and that adds to the completion points. I guess you can call it completion points. So a painting with more completion points around the focal point is a really, really good uh, composition. All right, so I'm just going to make him look like a robot because I don't want to go in there and make him look more human. This is just going to be a little bit more intriguing anyway. Robots are cool. I'm thinking Iron Giant right now. <laughs> What's a robot doing talking to a dragon? That's really fucking cool. Now I'm just curious. Probably recruiting him for Jon Snow's army. Hello, have you heard of our Lord and Savior, Jon Snow? Alright. So this is completion points right here. We have detail where there's supposed to be a focal point. See that? Everything is pointing to this guy and he had no detail before. So drawing a couple notches here and there, I made him have a little bit more detail. Now what I'm going to do is use a sponge tool. I already used mid-tone, so it kind of helped, but I'm going to desaturate this highlight. This light source, I'm going to desaturate it on purpose because I don't want it to behave like we have a white light source, I mean a, a colored light source in a cool environment. That's too much color going on. All right. Since he's a robot now, I'm going to... 
add that highlight to his head. Any more weird little shines catching some light from a distance. Let me get that here. Creating that shine back, which is really, really fun. Just like this. And then the tops of his waist, like that, are catching some light. The tops of the rest of these pieces catching some light. And I'm doing this because I want to show you how important it is to make sure your composition has the, P, uh, the point of interest, the POI. Shoulders as well have some light caught on them. Okay, so the little robot is talking to the dragon. And the light source is nice and, and non-colored. So when it hits the dragon, it diffuses all his values. So go back and zooming out, I'm going to try to perfect the spotlight here. The spotlight is too fat. I don't like it. What I want to do is give it some variety. So maybe the hottest point of the spotlight shines only on the on the robot, but there are points of saturation belts right here left over from the from the painting beneath. And so what I'm going to do because there's a mid-tone among all of this highlight on the outskirts of this ray, there are mid-tones. These mid-tones boost saturation all the way up, just like that. So now we get the saturation back that we lost that was on the rock. We get it back over here. So I was talking to you again on Discord and I said that the red that you used is way too warm. This light environment, meaning it's a blue light environment, it's dark, the light is very dim, it's an, an underground cave. You do not get warm versions of these values. You need a much cooler, this is very warm considering, it's very desaturated. Warm meaning that it's this desaturated. It's just going to look warm compared to all the cool because it's not as saturated. So it may be cool over here, but it's warm over here. So what I want to do is boost, shift this color even more into the saturations, just like this get some blue so that it looks less warm because the reason why it looks warm is because of this red here. So I'm going to with a very very thin layer. He still has color but it's a color of his skin, a new color once all this cool value washed over it. So he may look brown in daylight but under underground he does not look brown anymore. There isn't enough light yellow light to feed the orange and yellow in that brown uh, formula. And then we've got the red of the eyes. Still not cool enough, still very orange. Even in the slider here and here, they're both warm. Uh, all the way up here near cherry red. That's a big mistake. Underground, it would not be. If it's a light source, if it's a flame light source just by itself, that's fine. That would look okay. Um, but if it's some kind of trick you're playing with the light just to make him look a little bit more intimidating, um, he definitely does not have, he cannot have this warmth uh, in his eyes. And I don't recommend it. Uh, the reason why is because we're working against a uh, narrative, and the narrative is speaking about a mysterious, or at least how you've described it, a mysterious dragon from the dark speaking to a guy on, in the light. He kind of feels like he's, by the way, the the wash cools down this eye all the way. So I wouldn't make this too bright a light source because you're really throwing off this scene. So let me show you what that means. When I when I bring this value, first of all, I'm going to bring the value down with darken. Look at what happens to the illustration when I bring that all the way down. It goes back to him, doesn't it? That's what you want. Um, and if the eyes are the only way you're making this dragon look noticeable, then it's not a very well-painted dragon. Um, so if, if you're depending on the light source of the dragon, uh, as, as eyes as a light source, then you are carrying, putting too much weight on just the eyes to carry that illusion. You should be going for form. Look at all these areas here where you've got nothing but mid-tone from edge to edge. Look at the base, the, this, 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 this thing should be jumping up and down because there's areas that are either facing the light and the notches on his skin or not. He's a lizard. They don't have smooth skin. They either have wrinkles or they have bumps on them or scales or something. Look at that. It should be doing this kind of jumping. You see those jumps? So here and here. And this is in the light area, so imagine here. See those jumps? We need to have that kind of surface texture over here. 
but look, oh, you got away with it because you made the eyes shine. So no, you can't, you can't pull off this, um, you know, the only way we see the form is because of the eyes, the eyes carry the dragon feeling. You've got an open mouth that might possibly be drooling. You've got nostrils that might be a little bit more wet. You've got horns that might be a little bit more reflective, maybe broken. You've got all these areas here for scale. You've got this entire fang type, I don't know what it is, um, claw type thing here that could be catching more light. And what can help you in this kind of scenario? A nice, beautiful form study. Turn this into a form study. Go back to its bare bones and you'll be able to render this a lot better. Because right now all I see are lines and an attempt at some you know, really, really minor surface texture to pull off that claw. That claw is not in a light source situation. That claw is just just a bunch of, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, just really, really basic elementary values. You need to be showing how the light is sneaking in just a little bit on this part more than this part. This part is kind of getting eclipsed right here. And so we have a little bit of shadow and then we've got some bounce light off the rock nearby and now we have a claw again and that's why we do form studies just here help me figure it out if i think claw i'm going to get my pencil crayons and like i was a kid i would just you know make crazy texture to make it look scary just because the texture is high doesn't mean we pulled off the feeling of a of a value or a feeling of some some form or something like that we actually have to go in and manually paint the form in all right so now it looks a little bit more like a claw just like this. So you had that chance. You have all this area right here uh, that could be getting some light off this ray, which has basically become the god of your painting. So this ray, I'm choosing the exact color. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm actually using the exact color on this to get some of that light out. Um, for the dragon's design, you got two tiny nostrils and two tiny eyes and a tiny mouth. I recommend you boost the size of the of the nostril. So let's take a look at some dragons. Just the dragon design itself. So smog. He had tiny nostrils but humongous eyes and a really, really massive jaw. Massive mouth. But tiny little nostrils, almost the same size as the eyes. But his nostrils still were very, very fat, you know, very wide, very open. They looked like they functioned. Very scary. Wherever that he had sharp sharp Features wherever you go. So what do I mean by sharp features? Or is the word fox I remember her name. So she's got crazy sharp features everywhere now. Um, way too much plastic surgery. Uh, so what we have is sharp eyebrows, sharp eyes, sharp nostrils reaching a sharp point, lips reaching a sharp point, sharp blue eyes, sharp jawline. So we've got too much sharp. And when you have a combination of sharp and soft, so maybe it was it could be a soft brow. And uh, there's this one actress that was the um, the actress for the wife that he was supposed to marry. Oh, what's her name? God damn it! Um, I know, I know who she is. Mordred's girlfriend, Merlin actress. All right, I know exactly who she is. There she is. This one. So she's got a combination of sharp and soft. She's got sharp eyebrows, but soft circular. So triangle, circle, a couple of sharp features, and then circles again, and then back to triangles and sharp points. So what you want to do is balance that. This is not just in portraits, or it's also in creatures. And that's why when we have characters that were supposed to be scary, we use all sharp points everywhere. Sharp eyes, sharp eyebrows, sharp nostrils, triangle, triangle, triangle. When I say sharp, I mean triangle points. We have a triangle point right here triangle point right here, triangle point right here, 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 of course the teeth, and that's how we make something look intimidating. So when you have a, a combination of the two, then you can use that for portraits, but when you're going for something intimidating, um, this is not intimidating anymore because we have barely any sharp points. We have a couple circular points. The eyes are very circular. The nostrils are you know, curved at the edges. He seems like a very nice dragon. Um, but from the teeth and the drool, I think, I feel like you're going for something a little bit more intimidating than that. So you might want to think about redesigning the dragon, taking him into like a nice uh, thumbnail type setup and studying some silhouettes, figuring out which features you want to be a little sharp, um, which you want to be a little less sharp. Uh, when you build your language like this, when you, when you understand that each 
of these shapes ha is a word in their language system and along with all the fundamentals that you have more uh, you, you have more that you can access to, to de design with so um, the point of the class is to show you yes this word exists you can add it to your vocabulary and design through it um, but you guys actually have to go and attempt it and apply yourselves for you to really remember that this is a shape vocabulary that you're supposed to be used uh, you're supposed to be using that's supposed to be used uh, so don't just you know nod your heads in this class go use it go figure it out make sure that uh, you've attempted it at least once actually going in and thinking about the variations between each shape of of the features and when was the last time you painted a, fe a portrait that with that much detail so it's a really excellent study all of these rays are pointing in the wrong direction if they're all coming out of a light source that is a sunlight outside of the cave they should all be pointing in the same exact angle over here. The sun is far away enough that this angle is um, needed in this in this way. So I'll just do one and then I'll duplicate it one more time. And they're all using the same color as him. As for their placement, like I wouldn't really, these two are almost the same level and these two are the same level. So you gotta take one out of each. So I'll take this one out and I'll take this one out. You had two and two. I mean, it was too symmetrical. And you don't even you notice they did that, did you? Oopsie. Oh, it's okay. I'll erase it later. So you probably didn't notice that you did that, but it just happened. And that's again, we don't we don't think about things until we've made the mistake okay so angles are parallel all around here and I'm just going to bring in some minor minor texture just all around all right so I brought in some of that basic basic stuff and I'm just showing you where some of those details might happen and again, only the top of each of these little bumps is going to get the light. I'm going to go to each one and cast a quick shadow. And that's how we detail scales. That's how we go around detailing them. I'm sorry I haven't read the comments for those asking questions. I just have to focus on this paint over for now. Okay, some really, really basic shadows something very very basic to fill in the detail in this area because this area is very close to the focal point all right but again the features are very very soft all around you also don't have any bounce light on like the chin over here you could have had some really really cool bounce light again this whole rock face is facing him there's a lot of light facing him so he could be getting a lot of light here in this area. His nostrils could have a little bit of light shining on the water inside, getting some light through them. Or whatever moisture, you know, dragons have, I don't know. Just to show a texture difference, the top of the nostrils here could have some light, like that coming off the top. The very, very top of the head, which is an example of your needing form studies, um, the whole top of his head should have been brighter than anything else in the portrait and anything else in the canvas because it's the square. So you've got the square like that and you didn't have a differentiation between the top of the square and the sides. Even in a dark scene, we have changes between these angles. Um, if we have a square in a dark room, one side will always still be brighter than the other sides. One side faces whatever light is there uh, in that dark room. So that's a, an example of you not breaking down the dragon. You're painting him from edge to edge instead of painting him as a sculpting, as a sculpture, instead of sculpting. And then once you've settled all of this light source stuff, then you can go in for the eyes and you can, and, and all the detail, then you can go into the eyes and boost them up if you want um, because you're no longer depending on them. Again, I think this color is just a little bit uh, too unusual it's a dark scene I would love to see a little bit more work done on the dragon um, just on, on on the flesh or showing where the, the wings seem like they're coming out of his neck as well there doesn't seem to be a very long neck maybe he could have been crouching but I hope this has helped you a little bit 
There's one more thing that you guys need to do. And uh, what we do is uh, multiply. I'm going to just boost the saturation. We need to frame the canvas. Just like that. So it turns back into a dark room. You have the spotlight on one character. If you're in a play and you're watching a play, the spotlight always, if the spotlight is on one character, it means that character is important. It doesn't mean that another character can start talking on the other side of the stage and the spotlight isn't on them unless they're doing some sort of vocal effect or something like that. So that's what I mean. Anything around here can get that light, but this is what I mean by that dragging, dragon having nothing to um, show in this, in this illustration. He has no power. He has no narrative power. So you detailing him just a little bit more, giving him more of a dramatic pose will kind of help. So before, you didn't have a differentiation between the two. You had a slight highlight, no drama, no zooming out. Also, the canvas is too wide. I'm going to just crop it for now. It's too cropped. Instead of uh, shift it over. Actually, you know what? I'm going to shift it. Everything is over the side too much. It should be a little bit. You can have it non-symmetrical, but we still need it to occupy close to the center instead of the far, far side. So, before, after, there's real light source, there's some bounce light happening around the claw, which is the threatening point, the point that's threatening to kill him. He's between two humongous claws that are going to kill him, and for somehow he's kept the dragon at bay. Somehow he's pushed him off. Um, so, there it is. This is what your thumbnails are supposed to look like. Your, your thumbnails are supposed to have this kind of balance in your, in, your, in your light sources. Detail, scope, and contrast, and shrinking your brush, they're all supposed to be dealt with you know, when, when you choose your focal point in the grayscale stage. Then you can bring in the color. Because if you have color to deal with and you're not very good with your forms, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. The dragon is still really, really underdesigned. He seems very, very basic. It feels like almost a friendly dragon. So if you looked up Pete's dragon, he, he has no sharp points. Remember that whole feature thing? Um, Pete's dragon. Yes, I watch a lot of doggy videos. <laughs> um, so he has a very square face, curved on the edges, very sweet looking. And then you compare him to Smog. <laughs> and then you compare him to Smog um, right over here. And you see that difference? There are no curved edges. They took no shortcuts at all. They wanted him to look like a dick. Um, so you've got circles. I'm so sorry for the kids watching this. Um, um, just don't say these bad words, okay? Um, so you've got curved edge. The triangle hasn't been spared. Um, has, hasn't been, um, yeah, spared. And then we've got that and that. Sphere. Sphere. Spherical nose. So you, this dragon isn't really, he's just like Pete's dragon with scales. Um, so please remember this, this shape language, um, the, the, this balance between uh, if you want a protagonist or a beautiful woman that's a little bit more striking, you have a balance between sharp and soft features. Um, and then you, you can't go all sharp or all soft. If you go all soft, you're drawing a Samwise type, pudgy, pudgy unintimidating cutie. And if you go all sharp, you're drawing a antagonist. All right? You can't go all soft, and if it's a dragon, we go all sharp. So it's working on him just a little bit more. See all the staging and fixing the light? It helps a lot. It's fixed a lot of issues, but it hasn't changed the fact that the dragon just does not feel scary to me. Um, there's also another thing you can do. This canvas, is, the, the camera isn't low enough. And one thing that you can do is uh, just this section. <clears throat> kind of do this type of deal. So he looks a little bit like he's from Worm's Eye looking up. And the dragon, we see more of the lower, lower portion of his jaw. That'll make it look a lot less leveled. Um, but that's all I have to say for this one. I hope this was, this was helpful to you. <clears throat> so save that. Yes. Now let me look at the comments. <laughs> um, spicy. All right. <laughs> Uh, could an alien-esque creature be round and intimidating? 
No, round isn't... Uh, okay, let's say someone tried to mug you. One of them had a sharp stick and one of them had a... <laughs> One of them had a floaty, a floater for, you know, those children's floaters um, for the pool. All right. One of them had a circular ended floaty. Which one would you be more intimidated by? <laughs> That's it. If you want them to be intimidating, you don't give them spheres or circles. An alien still has very sharp eyes, tiny little um, slits like uh, Voldemort type nostrils or a uh, very sharp, tiny little mouth, tiny little teeth. Those are all considered triangular. Those are all considered sharp. So the, the head may be round and funny looking, looking like a toddler, uh, which I always laugh at, the classical design of an alien. Um, but the, uh, the features are all still sharp, so they make up for that. But all round all the time does not look scary. Golem has a lot of sharp features. Um, so let's look up Golem. Lots and lots of sharp features. They're all sharp. When he softens up, he's a little bit more round, but he's got a lot of sharp features. Look at the ends of his eyes. He's got very big round eyes. They do have to, you know, he's still a, he's not a, he's not an antagonist. He's still a very cute character as uh, Tolkien des uh, describes him, but he's still capable of a lot of evil. Features very sharp. Nostrils very, very sharp, kind of looking like Megan, Megan Fox. Um, really, really sharp cheekbones, sharp jawline. Um... Uh, there's just this triangular laugh line over here that's kind of aged him as well. Uh, when he gets cute, they kind of just cancel all that out. He's just got more round, so you see a little bit less of the sharpness. His eyes are massive. And you see how we have less of the teeth? And that, that more circular? We don't see all these sharp edges anymore when he's cute. Uh, but when he goes back to being evil, all these pieces are back. Triangle, triangle, triangle. It's all about the expressions and what's caused by these shapes when you're designing this character. That before, after. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm so hungry. Um, all right. I don't see any at Isterax, so um, I'm not done yet. <clears throat> For this piece, just like the others, the reason why it's problematic is because we don't see the underbelly of the dragon. So let's try this again. Let's try it again, but in a different setup. We have that's way too freaking bright. Holy God. All right. So let's try it again. The dragon is kind of standing around the guy. So if I were to design this, I would have done a little something like this. I would have started off with a hill type situation. I would have drawn the guy in his position standing in a two point three point perspective. So his three point perspective isn't just about shrinking the head. It's about overlapping the shoulders on the headline. No neck is visible. Legs are wider up. Um, he's kind of looking up, so he's, you know, really, he's like, oh, I'm not scared of you. And then I'm going to make him much smaller. God damn it, Mr. Rick. I didn't make a new layer. <clears throat> so I'm going to make him much smaller than the dragon. And the dragon, I want to put on an angle. And even if he's not that big, I want to make him seem big. Um, and then I would show more of the underbelly of the dragon. And then his hand, his arms are probably going to be like the wings, the way they do them in Game of Thrones or something like that. And one of the criteria was the dragon is so big he's outside of the uh, of the canvas. Maybe his head is a little bit low. Maybe he's got a little neck, and he's talking to him with his side face because the dragon's eyes are on the side. He wouldn't really be facing him, and he'd be smiling away with his piercing eyes and his expressive eyebrows. And he's not giving this character the info he needs. Look at how much more intimidating this feels. Because we've got a low camera, and we've got this dragon towering over everything. And then we've got the legs from the back, another set of legs over here. Massive, massive. Um, we also don't even need to have this uh, dragon's head so low. We could have had him a little bit higher. Um, all the way up in the air, somewhere there. Dragon looking massive in the air. Atmospheric fade used on the top. His head didn't have to be that low. That's all we need to make it have an effect. Uh, to make it look even more intimidating, we just need a shrinking in scale, a change in scale. So the, the character was a little too close to the size of the head. So we make him even smaller, something like this, and he looks scary. What if the character also has like an intriguing little pose, um, you know, like a... He's like, you know, almost falling at his legs or something like that. And he's ready to run away or something like that. Holding up an, uh, I don't know, a lamp or some kind of magical artifact. 
So I gave you free reign on the type of dragon, the type of character, but when we're talking about intimidation, the lesson was that the character was supposed to be much at a much a high a, a, a disadvantage, a physical disadvantage, a great physical disadvantage to the dragon, all right? Even if it was a five foot high dragon, you should have staged it in a way that made the dragon feel like he is at a physical advantage against the guy. So here, I mean, the camera is not in the dragon's perspective. The camera is not, the dragon could have been you know, holding the camera. The, drag, the, the camera is not in the character's perspective. Leveled canvas, I don't feel afraid for, I just feel like they're talking to old friends. And he doesn't seem like he's hungry and bored and he really wants to eat him. When we're, when we're looking at Merlin, at no, at no point did we really feel like he was going to get eaten by that dragon. Okay. Um, this painting is a little bit problematic because you have a tile canvas, which is a big mistake. And then you've got the character whose uh, pose is very, very off. Her lower body is massive compared to her upper body. I'm literally just going to do that, shrink her lower body. She's going to feel a lot more symmetrical. Oops. I'm going to leave that alone. All right. And then when we're crouching down to pick something up, we don't really do it in a Vogue magazine type way. It's more of a utility um, than a than a a utility pose is a pose that's actually going for it. They're actually trying to do something. A pinup pose is, is not. Nobody sticks their ass out when they're trying to pick up a tissue that fell on the floor, unless you're trying to seduce your ex or something like that. Um, so what you want to do is really make her feel like her her you know her spine. Bended for bent forward to pick up this this uh, little kitten. All right, and then her head would be a little bit lower behind her uh, behind her collar to actually go down and pick that up. Do you get what I'm saying? So don't overpose it if you're going for a sincere scene. She's probably only doing it for the Instagram likes if she's posing like that. All right, so she actually looks like she's picking something up. That collar was too high. You want to shrink it, go ahead. But this is where the head would be if that collar wasn't in the way. It would still be there. I feel like she's really picking something up. Whereas before, it felt like she was a little bit contorted, humanoid type, body type, and a... Uh, a cube canvas, a tile canvas is really, really bad for composition. So before, after, did I really do that? Right. Also, you have a problem here. This character should be eclipsed. Um, you have a yellow that's a dark yellow in a light environment that doesn't support yellow. It's dark scene. It's nighttime. And this whole character should have been in a shadow. So we've got darken. And when we darken yellow, what do we do to yellow when we darken it? When there's not enough light to feed the yellow, how do we do dark yellow? How do? Does anyone have an answer to that question? All right, so I'm going to keep some of the rim light. She's wearing like a raincoat type deal, I think. Subsurface on the ears of the cat. But her, there is no universal light source on her. There's the one that we can cheat with that we use in illustrations. But you really like push this, this nighttime scene, this rainy scene with the reflection of the street. It's very beautiful. But you really pushed it, so you kind of you know, screwed yourself over. You can't use a, a cheap primary light source for the illustration, like a camera light. You can't use that. You screwed yourself over. Desaturated, exactly. No, not brown. Just desaturated. Just plain old gray. Yellow looks white in the darkness. Wear a yellow shirt. Turn off all the lights. And try to, try to just make out the yellow. You're going to see white or gray. All right, we still see this as a yellow shirt. I still see yellow. 
I don't have to be held by the hand and oversaturated and have an oversaturated color just so I can see yellow. All right, so the point of this entire painting is that you had a rim light going on and the street lights were taking center stage. The street lights right now are the glamour. They're the beauty factor. It's not her. I don't care what kind of crazy drag queen, drag queen makeup she's wearing. She could go crazy. She could wear a $7,000 dress. The, the point of this painting right now is that the lights on the street are the, the narrative. The fact that you know, just these two creatures came together and this is the environment, a magical moment between a cat and, and the future owner. And this is the magic around that has set it. At this, this kind of illustration is where environment and background are more important than character. So we have, you know, all this beautiful background color and now we have an even more believable scene. Um, as for the yellow down here, I feel like this yellow has just come out of left field. I don't feel like it belongs in here. The palette is very, very cool. You can try to bring in some of this nearby blue at least just to carry some of that texture down, some of that light down, do something with it so that it doesn't, it's very awkward when all the light stops at the character and then we have our own little world down here. It's very awkward. What you want to do is make the environment bigger than the character, meaning the character doesn't stop the light source from traveling. So that's when it kind of feels a little bit more normal when we do that. That box would allow some reflection through it. Um, one moment, please. I have to figure out what's wrong with the stream. What's it called? It's telling me there's a problem. Um, do you guys hear me okay? It's giving me a red sign. So does that, what does that mean? There, view on the watch page. Let me see if it's paused or anything like that. I don't know. Uh, just let me know if I, if I, you know, let me know on Discord, guys, if I uh, blank out or blank out or whatever. Okay, so I've continued that blue color lower. If you reference for some reason, stream is fine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if if for some reason you did have a yellow spot in your illustration, you probably should, I mean, in your reference, go back to the reference and see if it works, uh, if it really is like that. But before, after. So we have a lot less... Uh, that, that yellow just looked like it came out of, you know, a completely different dimension. And now you have a vertical canvas, at least more vertical. I think you should make the canvas more vertical because what's happening is the magic of the light is happening out there. And so when we have an interruption of that, we end up having a smaller world. Just see how nice that is when we extend the world a little bit higher. Like she stopped in the middle of the street to pick up a cat. Uh, the world is so much bigger than her. She's taking up too much space in the old version. And she needs to uh, look like she's actually bending forward. Rethink the design of the collarbone. You're losing a lot of silhouette on the character. So you're losing the chin. Now let me try to do it. Damn it. You're losing on the... Maybe do the collar like that a little bit. So you're losing the chin, you're losing a lot of stuff, which, which really sucks because it's all you have for the character is this silhouette. So I'm gonna try to get that chin back. should work a little bit better. Now we have some character coming through. I don't know what made that collar so important. I don't know why that collar felt like it really needed to, uh, <laughs> it was more important than the face. Maybe that collar it has a high heat ego or something like that, but it did not, it did not belong there. All right. And then just uh, cleaning that up. Now you get some of the character back. Again, if your reference showed a weird collar or something, you might not have interpreted it properly, or it might have been a bad photograph from a really bad photographer. So 
So it, it you know, don't always put the reference ahead. Just sometimes the, the photographer, photographer takes a bad photo. Lighting is still perfect. The photographer didn't set up the lighting, he set up the staging. So he might have done a bad job and you're copying them and you have it and, and you, you know, you're transferring it into a painting. You're already going to make mistakes on top. You're going to share the photographer's mistakes as well. All right, so it looks a little bit more realistic. She actually looks like she's folding uh, her body forward. Her She looks like she's about to step up. Um, it's no longer a weird contortion. The head felt tiny compared to the lower body. Um, there's no weird butt sticking out type uh, feeling with the spine. The spine feels very utility. It's in the motion. She's actually bending forward in her moment. In her life of glamour, she stepped, you know, she took a moment to look at something that is less fortunate than her. So those shoes don't cost no $10. All right, and I will flood the light. It's kind of a divine scene, so I would get a light source to flood the top. I don't have any more time for another painting. I hope today was good. That, that other painting is a character design. It's a completely different type of uh, painting. So I'm just using some light here at the top using dodge tool to kind of boost that up and then I'm going to go back to normal and drown the top in some light to explain why she has all this rim light around her okay <laughs> and freaking choke the cat <laughs> um, the shoes are warm you're right Daniel absolutely right um, I completely overlooked that the shoes are way too warm value um, and saturated what you have to do is choose a color that's more cool so you actually go into the purples and go into the saturation here's a rule you guys ready when you have a cool wash or a warm wash and you have a color that's supposed to be cool but it's desaturated desaturated values in a saturated environment Desaturated colors look warm or cool against their environment, against the opposing environment. If it's a cool environment, they will look warm. If it's a warm environment, they will look cool if you over desaturate. Did you guys understand what I just said? Show me a one if you understood what I said. Show me a two if you didn't. So let's say that this is all a wash that is cool. If for some reason one area is particularly desaturated, it'll look warm compared. If an area is warm, a whole warm wash, a sunlit, sun-kissed scene, and you got one area that's super desaturated, it looks cool compared. Uh, no? Alright, so I, I just reiterated it. I hope that helped. But remember, just make sure nothing is randomly desaturated. 1.5. <laughs> Watch someone give me like a 69 or something. <laughs> Just basically, is what, what I'm saying is don't let something be undersaturated. Um, and, uh, and don't let something be too saturated either, but undersaturated and too saturated. But undersaturated does the opposite effect of the wash. So desaturate, over desaturation creates the op opposite tone of the wash. You can like write that back to me if you want. All right, so we've got before, after, eclipse scene, light source behind, character silhouette is a little bit more sharp. Um, you did not need this flooding light. Don't over create, don't over rim light. Don't do the rim light everywhere. The hair, yeah, because it's subsurface scattering, but the chin is still very thick and very opaque. We don't get subsurface scattering here. This is going to flatten out the image. All this excessive rim light you had flattened it out. You can write that back to me, okay? So excessive rim light flattens out an image because it works like an outline. And that is it for today. My hair is frizzy. My face is oily. <laughs> oh, man. Why is sitting in front of the computer make your face oily? Somebody fucking tell me. My, my, my mascara is running. This is how I get after every lesson. I just give it my all and <laughs> I look in the mirror and I just look like a monster. Um... So this is this is me saying I don't want to share my face with you guys. <laughs> um, desaturating creates the opposite tone of the wash. Excellent industry. Uh, excellent class. Thanks a lot. No. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you everyone for watching today. If you guys enjoyed today's class, 
uh, please feel free to go to my website, serac.com, if you want to join the community. The community is a place where you can post your work, the stuff I choose uh, work to critique from. So you join it, follow the rules, read the rules, um, and make sure you post to the right category. The next challenge, I might run a poll, I might not, but the next challenge won't be for at least two months. So October 1st will probably be when I assign the next challenge. It will be like a Halloween type darkness feel for the challenge. Um, so if you guys want to join that, uh, look out for it. Uh, but a heads up, it will be an action scene between a protagonist and an antagonist. And it will be all out gestures. So it'll be all about the gesture drawings, all about anatomy, all about the feeling of action and open gestures. If you don't know what open gestures are or you're curious about my words on gesture drawing, there are some videos in my video history that describe my distinction between different kinds of gestures and which ones are best for action scenes. Um, but yeah, if you want to get started on some basic thumbnailing, basic gesture drawings, or just perfect your figure drawing and gestures in general to prepare for the challenge, go ahead. But it won't be for a couple months uh, because I, I, I'm not doing another challenge for a while. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.